Mr. Charles Stevenson, an enlisted soldier in the First World War and prominent businessman with Hallmark in Kansas City, conceived the Fort Leavenworth Hall of Fame. It was established in 1969 by the Henry Leavenworth Chapter of AUSA and the Fort Leavenworth Command to honor outstanding military and civilian leaders of the armed forces of the United States who have served at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas and made a significant contribution to the achievement, tradition, or history of Fort Leavenworth and the Armed Forces of the United States. Eligibility for the Hall of Fame is extended to military and civilian personnel of all ranks and grades of the Armed Forces of the United States who have been stationed at or assigned as a student at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Nominees must have made a significant contribution to Fort Leavenworth and the Armed Forces in the realm of caring for soldiers, special achievement, tradition, or history. The nominating committee includes historians from various universities and general officers. They convene annually to review nominations and investigate their careers to ensure they meet the rigorous criteria. They forward their recommendations to the Board of Governors. The Board of Governors then vote on the nominations, selecting two for induction that year. Some of the most notable inductees are Meriwether Lewis and William Clark of the Lewis and Clark Expedition, whom you can find outside the auditorium doors in the atrium. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the entrance of the official party and remain standing for the national anthem and an invocation given by the Command and General Staff College Chaplain, Chaplain Sean Gee. Father, we seek your blessing upon today's ceremony and everyone attending. We especially give thanks for General Walker and General Wallace's faithful service to their country during times of both peace and war. We recognize and are humbled by the fact that we stand upon the shoulders of leaders like them, leaders that have gone before us, modeling courage under fire, wisdom to write doctrine that shapes the force, consummate professionalism, and a living faith that sustains a leader. As we reflect today upon their contributions and service, may it inspire us all to be better leaders for our nation's sons and daughters. In your holy name I pray, amen. Please be seated. Today, we are honoring the latest inductees into the Fort Leavenworth Hall of Fame. They are General Walton H. Walker, and General Retired William S. Wallace. Both inductees were elected by the Board of Governors of the Fort Leavenworth Hall of Fame in January of this year. The official party for today's Hall of Fame induction ceremony includes Lieutenant General Michael D. Lundy, Commanding General of the Combined Arms Center and Fort Leavenworth. To his right is Command Sergeant Major Eric C. Dusty, Command Sergeant Major of the Combined Arms Center and Fort Leavenworth. 
Accepting on behalf of the late General Walton H. Walker is Colonel Walton Walker, U.S. Army retired, and to his right is General William S. Wallace, U.S. Army retired, former commander of the U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command. Please allow me to recognize our special guests in attendance today. We have the Honorable Frank Offert, Mayor, Platte City, Missouri. Mr. Michael Hockley, civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army, Kansas. Lieutenant General Robert Arter, U.S. Army retired, civilian aide emeritus to the Secretary of the Army, Kansas, and Hall of Fame inductee, and Mrs. Arter. Lieutenant General Rich Keller, U.S. Army retired, CGSC Foundation trustee. Mrs. William Wallace, spouse of the former Commanding General Tradoc and Combined Arms Center. Mrs. Michael Lundy, spouse of the Commanding General, United States Army Command and General Staff College. Lieutenant Colonel, retired Sam Walker, grandson of the late General Walton Walker. Captain Sam Walker, great-grandson of the late General Walton Walker. Command Sergeant Major Larry Smith, U.S. Army retired, former Command Sergeant Major, Combined Arms Center Hall and Hall of Fame inductee. General Officers, Command Sergeants Majors, Community Leaders. Welcome to you all and thank you for being here today. It is my distinct pleasure to now and honor and to now introduce Commanding General of the Combined Arms Center, Lieutenant General Michael D. Lundy. Well, good morning. It's, it's great to have all of you here, and I really do want to extend a special thanks to our honored guests that are here today, uh, both the Wallaces and the Walker family. We've got several generations of, of Walkers here with us, uh, certainly a family of service. I'd also like to extend uh, a special welcome to the Arters, our Casa Emeritus and Mrs. Arter. It's great to have you here. Uh, Mike Hockley, our new Casa, as well as Sergeant Major, one of our uh, honored inductees into this prestigious Hall of Fame. It's always great to have you here as a dog-faced soldier. Um, you know, today as we, as we look at these two very distinguished um, general officers, uh, it is truly an honor to be able to bring them into this Hall of Fame. As we look at General Walton Walker, a man who demonstrated extraordinary courage in combat in four different campaigns, uh, from Veracruz to World War I, to World War II in Korea. And he was in the Army at a time of change, and he led that change. And as one of Patton's Corps commanders, the most aggressive Corps commander uh, that Patton had, uh, he revered him. And he led Patton's charge across Germany. And Walton Walker was faced with the tough task when the Korean War broke out to take what was not a well-trained or well-equipped Army and be able to lead it in combat be able to consolidate and prevent uh, the loss of South Korea and be able to regain the momentum and drive north uh, to be able to achieve what, frankly, probably no other leader could have achieved. To be able to look at the challenges that he faced as a leader that exemplify all those things that we look for, courage, honor, character, aggressiveness, agility, and really a drive to be able to win Walton Walker exhibited every bit of that. And if you look at the Pusan perimeter, where he was faced with the 24th Infantry Division that was really green, not well equipped, not well trained, frankly on their heels, as well as the 25th Infantry Division, two times really in our Army's history that, you know, if you just took that into context and looked at the honor behind both of those divisions that followed, you might reflect on that pretty poorly. And that was the challenge that he had, that he had to lead soldiers that were not well trained and not ready. Uh, and he did. And he defended the Pusan perimeter, and frankly, the standard I order was what saved Korea. And he drove that force to the north, and then tragically, he was killed. He died in 1950 during the conflict, but his leadership was what saved that fight. So for that, today is why we're inducting him, and the contributions that he made, not only leading in combat, but the changes that he made across our army, uh, being able to bring in change, which is something that every leader has to be able to do. He led that with great uh, courage and certainly with agility. And you can look back at his time when he commanded the Desert Training Center, which is now called the National Training Center. Uh, you know, he, he basically set the conditions for us to be able to win in World War II. So this is a man of great courage, 
great leadership and great character, and he is most deserving uh, to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. So we can now post the orders for his induction into the Hall of Fame. Please remain seated as I read the citation. Walton Harris Walker graduated from the United States Military Academy in 1912. As a new major in 1917, Walker assumed command of the 13th Machine Gun Battalion of the 5th Division and World War I marked his first significant achievement as an infantry officer. Within months, he received two silver stars and was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel for his fearless leadership and excellent judgment and his exceptional devotion to duty during the St. Mihail and Meuse-Argonne offenses. He again served as battalion commander with the 15th Infantry Regiment from 1930 to 1933 at the American Barracks in Tichin, China. Lieutenant Colonel Walker graduated from the Army War College in 1936 and served as executive officer for the Army General Staff's War Plans Division. Rapidly promoted to Major General by 1943, Walker assumed command of the 4th Armored Corps and the Desert Training Center in the Mojave Desert. He organized the center to conduct its first core level maneuver exercises, applying operational insights he gleaned from operations in North Africa. In 1944, General George Patton selected Walker's Corps, renamed the 20th Corps, to spearhead Third Army's offensive through France, Germany, and Austria. Walker earned a reputation as a tenacious, courageous fighting general who often commanded at the front lines with complete disregard for his own safety. He earned his third Silver Star for actions at the Vieira River crossing and also awarded Distinguished Service Crosses by Patton for his extraordinary heroism in leading 20th Corps River Crossing at Melun, France, where his own driver was wounded. 20th Corps became known as the Ghost Corps due to its speed and effectiveness. Patton wrote to Walker and noted, of all the Corps I have commanded, yours has always been the most eager to attack. With the devastating invasion of the Republic of Korea by North Korean forces, Lieutenant General Walker engaged the enemy with the understrength of Eighth Army in July 1950. He intended to defend the vital port of Pusan at all costs, the last line of defense on the Korean Peninsula. Courageously conducting a masterful defense of the Pusan perimeter, Walker turned the tide of the Korean War and enabled the survival of the Republic of Korea. Killed in action in a Jeep accident, on December 23, 1950, Walker was posthumously promoted to general and again awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. Service at Fort Leavenworth, student, Command and General Staff School, 1925 to 1926. Lieutenant General Lundy and Colonel Walker will now unveil the shadow box that will be mounted in the Hall of Fame. Lieutenant General Lundy and Command Sergeant Major Dosti will now present a framed replica of the shadow box to Colonel Walker. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, speaking on behalf of the late General Walton H. Walker, Colonel Retired Walton Walker. General Franks, General Wallace, Lieutenant General Larder, Lieutenant General Wiggins, Lieutenant General Lundy, Dr. Hansen, distinguished members of the Board of Governors and of the Nominating Committee, fellow soldiers and servicemen, ladies and gentlemen. It's kind of intimidating to be standing up here. I remember back uh, being here in 1984-85. Uh, My dad had warned me when I got here not to be a spring butt, but like too many things, I didn't listen to my dad. 
I always thought I could come up with the toughest question for whoever the guest speaker was. I wasn't real popular with the rest of the class. <laughs> On behalf of my brother, Lieutenant Colonel Sam S. Walker, Sims Walker III, and Sam's son, Captain Sam Benjamin Walker, both of whom are with me here today. And on behalf of our mom, Charlotte Walker, who's now living in Pinehurst, North Carolina, and all the members of the Walker family, I am privileged to tell you how deeply we appreciate this distinguished honor which you are bestowing on General Walton Harris Walker today. Please allow me to be among the first today, sir, to congratulate you, General Wallace, for also being so honored today. I was intrigued, as General Lundy pointed out, by the similarity to General Walker's experience as commander of the 4th Armored Corps and Desert Training Center to your command of the National Training Center at Fort Irwin, experiences which clearly you benefited from as you were such effective combat corps commanders. It's so good to return to this beautiful and historic post. My brother and I were first here and had the run of this post in 1956-57 when our dad was uh, attending the Commander General Staff College. That was why he gave me that advice that I didn't pay attention to. Our mother remembers dad and her year here as one of her favorites because of all the strong relationships they both developed here with those classmates and wives who became lifelong friends throughout their careers in the Army. That's something you have to look forward to. There is no doubt that the Command and General Staff College was critical to General Walker's professional development. It led to his selection as the infantry representative on the staff and faculty of the Coast Artillery School at Fort Monroe, Virginia. Kind of tells you what it was like back then that we were still concerned about Coast Artillery. It further led to his promotion to lieutenant colonel and assignment to battalion commander in the 15th Infantry Regiment in China. That time had a tremendous impact on my father. The regiment's motto is, can do. And so that became my dad's man mantra. In fact, he named his fishing boat, the can do. Over the course of our lives, as my brother and I have read about General Walton Walker, we have been struck by the countless accounts of his phenomenal leadership and courage in combat as the commander of the 20th Corps and 8th Army, just as the citation reads. It seems that he was present at the key point of decision in every engagement. I first studied accounts of the Korean War in the Army Green Books here at the CGS Library when I was a student. But I also read accounts of the war by others, which seemed to have no semblance to what I understood it occurred. Then the Pulitzer Prize winning author John Tolan wrote in Mortal Kombat, Korea, 1951 to 1953. It is a thoroughly researched history of the Korean War which gives incredible insight to General Walker's leadership style, his courage, and his tenacity when the going got tough. Tolan's uniquely perceptive insights are based on the first-hand accounts provided by the officers who were closest to General Walker. Let me preface this. We pride our Army as being a first-rate learning organization. As the Army Combined Arms Center, we have here the intellectual center of the Army. It's carrying the guide on of learning for the Army. So permit me to please read just one account among the dozens Tolan provides. Those in Walker's small command group had come to know two Walkers. One was the aggressive leader who was merciless when senior commanders made casualty causing mistakes. The other was a reflective scholar who after each battle sought firsthand knowledge of both friendly and enemy's actions. Once in the privacy of his jeep or plane, he would critique those actions aloud, citing mistakes made and corrections needed. His aide, Joe Tyner, and his personal pilot, Mike Lynch, were convinced he was really rehearsing, for they noted that his observations became subjects for discussion at his next stop. 
he was all over the battlefield, visiting with commanders in their CPs, right out there on the front line with the troops. They became aware of the great influence of General George S. Patton on Walker. Although he seldom mentioned his old boss in the presence of others, he quoted him often during those critiques. He kept a copy of Patton's War as I Knew It in his quarters. Ever present on his desk was a summary of combat lessons learned as compiled by Third Army during numerous battles in Europe. The three officers most closely associated with him, McLean, Tyner, and Lynch, became convinced that Walker was fighting the North Korean People's Army much as Patton would have. His armor state of mind allowed him to assess and respond to the rapidly changing situations more swiftly than the enemy, and his broad experience in mobile operations provided a reservoir of options to draw upon when either surprised by enemy actions or disillusioned by friendly performance. My dad and my mom met and married in Japan in 1948. General Walker was soon thereafter appointed as commanding general of the 8th Army when I was born in Tokyo, Japan in November 1949. We have a photo of him with a big smile holding me at Christmas that year with a big white teddy bear with red overalls, which he had presented to me. We had that teddy for many years until it fell apart. All of us walkers have grown up and lived with the incredible legacy of General Walker. He who served with such moral and physical courage and integrity and commanded so famously inspired his son, Sam Sims Walker, to become the great soldier and commander that he was. Our father, in turn, also inspired my brother Sam, his son Benjamin, and me to follow hum humbly and proudly in both of their footsteps. General Walton Walker's legacy set the course for Sam and me and our extraordinary Army wives to parent our children to be all they can be, whatever they do. And we can proudly say that the Walker legacy lives on with each of them. Thank you again for the recognition you have given to General Walton Harris Walker as the great Army commander and patriot that he was. Thank you, Colonel Walker. Once again, Lieutenant General Michael D. Lundy. And again, it's my honor uh, to be able to, to welcome General Wallace uh, to the International Hall of Fame, or to the Fort Leavenworth Hall of Fame. We have two Hall of Fames here. And I've known General Wallace for some time, not just personally, but by reputation, and having served uh, with him and for him and been exposed to his leadership over many years. And I will tell you that he absolutely exemplifies everything that we think about when we induct someone in the Hall of Fame. A combat leader, a proven cavalryman, and I'm surprised that I do have to check his shoes though. All right, sir, so you're falling down on the job here in your age. I'm, I was expecting some, some strapped on boots there, but uh, we'll, we'll counsel that later. But a true cavalryman. Uh, having served in armored cavalry regiments through most of his, the younger portion of his career and, and ultimately served as Black Horse 6, commanding the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment. Uh, again, commander of the National Training Center, and that's where I was first exposed to his leadership. And actually, the first time I met him was I was the investigating officer of, of a helicopter uh, accident that he was on board that went down to an engine failure, and I had to go in and actually... Uh, as a young captain, interview the commanding general about his helicopter crash, but that, that's another story that we can talk about over a beer. But needless to say, I got lots of great counsel during that session. Uh, but I did get to see him leading out there at the National Training Center and training, and that's where I really had the first exposure to his extraordinary leadership. He then went on to command the 4th Infantry Division, and at that time, the 4th Infantry Division was our, our test division. It was the 21st um, Force 21. Uh, test division was really trying to figure out, you know, how we were going to evolve our army to be able to fight in this digital age. And he was exactly the right leader to be able to do that. He had the intellect, he had the foresight, uh, the vision to be able to bring that together to think about the capabilities that we need that really is our army today. 
And then after that, he went on to command the Fifth Corps. And he commanded that corps in combat as it went into Iraq during OIF-1 and destroyed five Iraqi divisions and two Iraqi corps and what can only be characterized as absolutely the kind of war fighting that Walton Walker would have done as well. Uh, aggressive, tenacious maneuver warfare to be able to defeat your adversaries swiftly and handily at very low cost to soldiers' lives. And that was because of the training and the leadership that he demonstrated. Then he came here to CAC uh, to be the commanding general of the Combined Arms Center. And I must say that, sir, I have cleaned up almost all of the skeletons you left. There's a couple things left uh, that I do have to still straighten out, but we're, we're getting close. Uh, and then he went on to command the training and doctrine command um, as, a, as a general. And a phenomenal job there in TRADOC of really setting the course uh, for our Army was going in the future. And his legacy and impact today, uh, we still feel it, um, the positive uh, impact that he's had across doctrine, training, leader development, education, uh, and really how we look at the future force. So it is truly my honor today uh, to induct uh, General Wallace, a great mentor, a great friend, a great leader, uh, truly a general officer who exemplifies everything that we should when we think about Army professionals uh, into the Hall of Fame. Sir, sure, congratulations. Let's read the citation. Please remain seated as I read the citation. General Wallace graduated from the United States Military Academy in 1969 and was commissioned an armor officer. After serving as a platoon leader with E Troop, 2nd Squadron, 6th ACR, Wallace deployed to Vietnam and became the Assistant District Senior Advisor for Advisory Team 20. In 1978, he graduated from the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, and subsequently served as the S3 and later Executive Officer of 2nd ACR. In 1986, Wallace assumed command of 3rd Squadron, 2nd ACR. After graduating from the Naval War College, he assumed command of the 11th ACR in Germany in 1992. Wallace commanded the National Training Center at Fort Irwin, California from 1995 to 1997. And in July of 2001, he assumed command of 5th Corps and deployed his unit in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. During Operation Cobra II, Wallace's 5th Corps fought over 300 miles, defeated elements of five Iraqi divisions, and two corps in addition to engaging thousands of irregular enemy. In July 2003, he took command of the U.S. Army Combined Arms Center at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Wallace brought a sense of immediacy to combat to of combat to Fort Leavenworth and told its soldiers and civilians, your contributions to the war effort are unrelated to how far you are from the scene. He fielded a draft counterinsurgency manual and also separated several elements of CAC's major subordinate operations from their parent elements to focus their support to the war effort and more directly. In October 2005, Wallace assumed command of TRADOC and he left active duty in December of 2008. After leaving active duty, General Wallace became an independent consultant to the defense industry, served as an independent director on the boards of Oshkosh Corporation and CICAI International, and continues to serve the Army on MITRE Corporation's Army Advisory Board and as the chairman of the Army Aviation's Senior Executive Advisor. Service at Fort Leavenworth, student, Command and General Staff College, 1982 to 1983. Commanding General, Combined Arms Center, 2003 to 2005. Lieutenant General Lundy and General Wallace now unveil the shadow box that will be mounted in the Hall of Fame. Lieutenant General Lundy and Command Sergeant Major Dosti present a framed replica of the shadow box to General Wallace. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, General Wallace. Well, 
General officers, sergeants, major, students, ladies and gentlemen, thanks General Lundy for, for this tremendous honor. It's always a pleasure to return to Fort Leavenworth, uh, made even more pleasurable this morning by the honor bestowed upon me today. I'm equally honored and humbled to be inducted alongside General Walker. And honestly, after listening to his citation, I'm wondering why the hell I'm up here at all. <laughs> uh, he was indeed one of the finest leaders and soldiers of his time and a true hero of both World War II and Korea. I'm most appreciative of this recognition, yet I fully realize that uh, recognition is not mine. Rather, it's that of the thousands of soldiers and leaders with whom I've served over the course of almost 40 years in uniform of the United States Army. It's that of the, the many mentors who took pity on me and helped me along the way. And it's that of the many friends and family whose support that I enjoy both then and now. It's a recognition that our Army is a team whose excellence is ensured by the understanding of a, a common doctrine through tough, realistic training under adverse conditions and the trust that leaders have in their soldiers and soldiers have in their leaders. I remember my time here at Fort Leavenworth fondly. This is a, a place with one of the most supportive community environments any place in the Army. This is a place where as a, a new major and after the rapid pace of the operational Army, I had a chance to reconnect with my family. This is a place where at the time we were presented with something called Airland Battle Doctrine and we had the opportunity in the classroom and occasionally in the, the mess hall to debate and ultimately accept its logic. This is a place where as a senior leader I returned from Iraq with the purpose of adjusting the institution to the realities of an army and a nation at war. Fort Leavenworth has always been a special place. For decades it's produced the finest leaders of ours in our allied partners armies. It's a place where professional soldiers gather to discuss and argue and adapt and learn. When he was Chief of Staff of the Army, General Gordon Sullivan often reminded us that the intellectual must precede the physical. Fort Worth Leavenworth is the place that guarantees that thought and learning precedes action. It's the place where the the seeds of the profession are planted early in the year and reach full bloom by the time graduation rolls around. There's also a spirit here at Fort Leavenworth, the spirit of our Army. Some of the most incredible history of our Army is here. The ghosts of Custer and MacArthur and, and Marshall walk these halls. An army that is the most gifted and most respected in the world. An army that's older than our nation itself. An army that from its very beginnings has always done the heavy lifting for our nation. This is an army which supported and defended the ideas of freedom and democracy well before there was a constitution to support and defend. This is an army that has traveled the globe in support of our national interest and the interests of freedom-loving people everywhere. This is an army that once committed brings hope to people and places where there was none. This is an army that depends on the intellectual foundation that is Fort Leavenworth. I'm proud to have been a small part of all of that. 
Thank you again to the Foundation, General Lundy, and all of you for this incredible recognition. May God bless each and every one of you, and may God continue to bless our great nation. Thank you. Thank you, General Wallace. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the Army song and remain standing for the departure of the official party. Receiving line in the atrium, we ask our distinguished guests to please use the exit to your left front and follow the commanders in chief hallway to the atrium. The reception begins shortly. This concludes our ceremony. Thank you all for attending. <laughs>